You're listening to Arsenal Pass, a flesh and blood podcast for players by players. And all about strategy, leveling up, and the latest news in the world of Wraith. Welcome to Arsenal Pass. So Hayden, they were uh, they were right all along. Azalea in the finals. Uh, Azalea v Azalea. One of them, Brody Spurlock. All those people that have been sitting on their skullbone cross wraps since Welcome to Wraith or Arcane Rising. I mean, um, they finally get their they finally get their payoff. I guess the, Azalea is finally good. Ranger is no longer a, a meme. What do you what do you think about this? Can can we draw enough conclusion to say that this this deck is real and specifically this hero is actually going to make uh, make an impact in the class constructed meta? I mean, from results only, no. But based on what I've experienced in my testing already, yes, definitely. Skullbone Crosswrap is a card that, look, I don't, I don't want to say I'm right, but, you know, when you're right, you're right. Skullbone Crosswrap is a card that we've talked about for a long time as one of the most powerful legendaries. The ability to, you know, opt and manip- manipulate. Deck manipulation is huge. You know, we see that with Crown of Seeds and, and how powerful that is. And Skullbone Crosswrap is, is a very powerful piece of equipment. So Arcane Barrier, Blade Break as well. Um, it was always a matter of time before Crossrate became what it what it can be in Azalea. Like mm-hmm. that is just the truth. Uh, I think in terms of the long term impact of you know, I feel like I'm in some bizarro world with Azalea versus Azalea mirror match in the finals. But you know, Azalea was something that was really talked up. You know, if you heard James White, he dropped to uh, as I know he said, you know, the set coming up, Azalea is going to be a top dog, and looks like he he wasn't lying. So. The card quality in the set, mm. you know, has really pushed Azalea to the consistency it needed, and that's kind of where we move from now as we head towards Baltimore. That's really my question: is are the cards from Outsiders are they more in line with, with where you think Ranger cards should be in power level, or do you think they're a little bit pushed um, above where they maybe should land in the future? Like, did did Azalea get cards that were? I guess, quote unquote, overpowered, and that's why it's finally able to compete? Or do you think that the the Ranger cards of the past were maybe a bit undertuned, and now the new cards printed in Outsiders just bring Azalea up with everybody else? I think it's a mix of both. I think it's more the latter, though. I mean, look, Red and the Ledger is still probably the most powerful arrow in that deck, and that, that is a card that was printed in the second set ever of Flesh and Blood. But, you know, when you look at a card like Infecting Shot or Sedation Shot or Withering Shot, these these arrows that bring with them an affliction that equals roughly about two damage but can be so much more impactful depending on the matchup you're playing into that is more that's probably slightly above above rate especially if it's the right arrow in the right right matchup but really what it brings you is consistency to put these effects on and the pumps i think the you know these non-attack action damage buffs are that they give consistency you now have seek and destroy you have premeditate you have uh take aim which is a card i can't wait to talk about in this in this podcast but yeah, look, I, I think we're going to get into it, I guess, as we get into the pod. But overall, I would say that it's not its not so much that it's overpowered, that's for mm-hmm. sure. Well, before we do that, let's hear about your week and uh, your week in flesh and blood. Yeah, I mean, this is episode 103 of Arsenal Pass. For those that haven't clocked on, uh, what are we calling this? The Azalea Effect? That's what I had called it. Brandon. Next week is uh, two years, by the way. Two <laughs> years of, of Arsenal Pass. Yeah, I mean, this week in flesh and blood has been good. I did course outside is dropping i can't believe it's just we've only just had release weekend it's yeah. crazy to think we've just had a, a big constructed event in two two constructed events i believe in the u.s is one on the east coast one on the the west coast this past weekend or chicago yes so not quite east coast but and also in california uh and i've been drafting i was drafting over the weekend i got in three drafts i would have liked to have gotten a few more in but didn't quite get the opportunity had quite a busy weekend as well so looking forward to doing a few more drafts this week get a draft tonight uh, really, you know, preparing. I'm just trying to understand outsiders and, and learn as much as possible. And the format is so deep. I've been really enjoying what I've done so far in this draft format. And my mind's just ticking over conversations with other players, just trying to absorb as much as possible. I feel so... What's the what's the, the word I'm looking for? I just feel so ill-prepared in these drafts. I just don't... I feel like it's going to take me a long time before I feel really good about going to these drafts. I felt like Uprising after 10 drafts, I really had a really good handle on the format. A lot simpler format. These heroes, the archetypes were basically non-existent. You know, it was very straightforward. I think it's very, very different in, in Outsiders. So, yeah, I've been enjoying that. And Class Constructed, really getting into some Class Constructed testing 
what are we now? We're a month away from Baltimore. So things are really starting to kick into gear for those testing for the PT. And I'm trying to learn as much as much as I possibly can about, about us constructed. Uh, I can talk a bit about that more in the sort of the crux of the pod in terms of what I think about this format and where we're going to go and what I've been testing. But yeah, it's been a, it's been a good flesh and blood week. I would say, how about yourself? Yeah, I cracked my first, uh, my first packs of outsiders got my product. Um, I was playing kitchen table versus my partner. So uh, I didn't immediately resort to some of the things that you had figured out previously. So I didn't play pile and I tried to not play assassin. I would say biggest takeaways were, yeah, it's definitely a lot harder. I feel like to put together a ninja deck in sealed, um, like significantly harder and Azalea is not Azalea, but I guess Azalea in particular, but Ranger is sort of the same way. I think that the cards are there. You just, you really need things to go right. Or in a, in a format like this, it feels like you can get fatigued, um, pretty reasonably and um yeah i mean assassin just is that sort of cornerstone foundational deck of the sealed format it seems like it's a it's an easy sort of slot in uh your card quality can be pretty reasonable and it's i guess it's somewhat skill intensive when you go to those like 35 versus 37 card mirrors and it gets it really goes down to value so yeah i didn't I didn't get to get too much uh, sort of high level practice, but I think that the takeaways that we had talked about previously, um, they held true in sort of my first, uh, my first run-ins with the format. Did you get a chance to play any Ranger, any Riptide in particular? Mm, no Riptide. I played specifically Azalea and then I uh, was messing around with Azuri. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I thought, I felt like the, the Blood Rock tokens were, in particular, they were as powerful as we had, as we had expected. And I think that some of the others we had, I had at least underrated slightly, specifically things like frailty. But yeah, uh, no Riptide, no Riptide. I wanted to go back to Old Azalea uh, and channel my inner Brody Spurlock for the sealed format. I think just reflecting a bit more on sealed, I haven't played any more sealed since, well, I played a little bit after pre release weekend, but. Riptide is standing out to me more and more. I look at the seal format as potentially if you have even a reasonably strong Riptide pool, just one of the most powerful things you can do. And that hero ability is really powerful. And I'm excited to explore it a bit more with Limited as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a cool format. I'm glad that we have the seal format. I asked uh, on Limited Time only last week, I asked Nick Butcher, my guest, I said, do you think the seal format could be used for competitive play? You know, for a calling, for instance, could it be used for road to national season, for progress season, for instance? And I think we both kind of came to the conclusion that there might be, you know, there's still this the old issues you have with sealed in terms of quality and consistency of pool, and maybe the very, you know, not being able to play ninja, for instance. You know, one third of the the class is not necessarily being particularly playable. We could be wrong on that, but that's kind of our takeaway. Uh, but it's so much better than other sealed formats we've had previously. Oh, I hate to break the news to you, but the the bar for a sealed format that is playable <laughs> at, a, at a calling is pretty low because the last time we did that um, at scale was Tales of Aria, and that was garbage. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, Outsiders is out, like you said. Uh, Skirmer Season 6 is coming up April 8th through 23rd. You had the limited time only with the Tall Timmy, Episode 3, um, and last week was Nick Butcher. Hayden, talk to me about these, uh, talk to me about Fab Player and talk to me about these distribution um and these errors with the packs i've seen all kinds of different things you know these quote-unquote god packs i've seen the sort of the i don't know if it was an entire pack or an entire box of where they were just like it was one card and another just two cards on one card basically split um talk to me about this is this is this a pro what is it why did it happen whose fault and is it gonna be a reoccurring problem as we look to draft this format in the future so there's, there's actually two things that I want to kind of highlight. One of them I talk extensively about on limited time only because of what it means for draft in terms of what it actually means for how you draft and what you see in the packs that you open. And then the other is more about collection and just what it's like to open packs in this format. So let's start with that one because that's the one that's had by far the most press. That's what's been all over Fab Twitter is these god boxes is, you know, people, a lot of these rainbow foil legendaries being opened. Uh, there's this infamous case of in the northwest, Pacific Northwest, of multiple boxes that had you know 16 rainbow foil legendaries plus in them. Every second pack basically having a rainbow foil legendary. So Alice has put out a statement uh, just yesterday around outsiders collation around this legendary and fabled cards. And so basically, what has happened is that in the factory there was for a short time they estimated it to be. Uh, they said 
less than 30 minutes that the common Rainbow Foil print run had Rainbow Foil legendaries and fables on the print run. So that's effectively what they're saying is it's it resulted in instead of Rainbow Foil commons being put into these packs, Rainbow Foil legendaries and fables being put into these packs. Now, it sounds like a pretty big deal, right? And I mean, it is, right? And we're, we're seeing the kind of repercussions of it. It looks like it's, you know, if anything, it means that more are going to be opened, which I'm not really going to speculate on secondary market value and things like that. But obviously, people have kind of pointed to that. But they sort of estimate that there's around uh, 0 .0, 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 additional Rainbow Foil Legendary and Fable cards being released into the market with Outsiders. So, I mean, it sounds quite small, but, you know, when it's a, the first of a print run and it all happened at the same time, so presumably the majority of these boxes are going to be open pretty soon, uh, it is quite a lot, I guess, for what we're going to see initially. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the statement. It sounds like, I guess, maybe it's a, it's a factory problem. It's not to do with the way they sent print runs or anything to the printer. Uh, it's just purely to do with what got run on a sheet at that time into packs. So yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of it. I mean, I, I don't know. What what are your thoughts, Brennan? You've kind of seen... It was, a, it was a pretty big... It was a hot topic, and it still kind of is. And, and people were pretty incensed, I would say. I would say... Uh, I think I was exposed to, like... A very ne like a very negative reaction to it mm -hmm. um but from people that i think were more primed uh they you know they were looking for something negative to happen so i don't put too much stock in it you know mistakes do happen and it it, it is unfortunate but i think the lss will ultimately learn from the learn from this instance and it most likely won't happen again i think that it's not going to impact our ability to like players like me and you Hayden. And I think a lot of players that listen to this podcast, our ability to enjoy the sad play it um, and sort of get the value we want out of it. The secondary market shakeup. Yeah. It's a bit frustrating. I could imagine, but I mean, that's part of the game. You're going to work with an imperfect system when you're looking to hold value in cardboard that's printed by a small studio in New Zealand. So it happens, man. Like it's all good. I think that I personally don't have too many thoughts in it because currently I'm 100% unaffected. So, and I don't, I actually don't expect that it will affect uh, me or you moving forward, right? Because it was just that small, that small portion of cards that, that, uh, that this happened to. But of course, when they were finally opened, they got a lot of publicity. Look, I mean, it's going to have at least some little impact on secondary value, but I think overall the impact is going to be pretty minimal. And if anything, I think now that we have this, the answer to what happened and how big the impact is i think one lss feel <laughs> a bit relieved to understand what's actually happened two is that you know these players now i think players who are opening product and going okay well there's 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 percent more legendaries this and it's you know it's not a case of the fact that there's less legendaries right there's actually more so it's not mm. like oh all these there's these god boxes and then there's these dud boxes that's not what's happened here it, it was a print run era that put more legendaries into boxes into packs so uh, I think people aren't going to be as worried about potentially opening packs like they might have been a couple of weeks ago or last week when this happened going, well, what, should I buy product? What if, you know, all these God boxes, that mean that there's going to be a case with no legendaries in it. So I think that kind of sets that at ease. And then I guess the kind of the be all and end all is that some people get really lucky and they've got some ridiculous product in their hands that has a lot of legendaries in it. So, you know, congrats to them. You know what? If someone came to me and they told me about how they were negatively affected uh, versus for the secondary value of their cards because of this, this instance, I would sit them down on my lap and I would tell them a little story about Monarch first edition, which is a million times worse <laughs> where the entire market was basically manipulated and we all kind of, we all kind of lost out. Sorry. It just makes me, makes me remember that situation. Cause like I said, I moved the reason why I'm in the CIA safe house right now is because I moved apartments and I had to move a lot of Monarch cases as a result. So uh, it's fresh on my mind. Uh, but speaking of that, let's help go ahead into the command and cookout Hayden. Oh, by the way, I got to mention because We've been talking Azalea. We do have a deck tech with the Brody Spurlock coming up as soon as possible. I'm recording with him. Um, I mean, I will have recorded with him by the time you listen to this. And then we got to run it through editing. We're going to get it out to you ASAP. Standard thing. Doing a video on YouTube. Brody's going to write us a little guide that you can, if you want extra stuff, you want the, the sideboard guide, tips and tricks. There'll be a little write-up on Patreon as well. But going to get that out to you all as soon as possible. Yeah, and, and uh, just as a, in a contrast to that as well, uh, I've taken some time, by the time this goes up as well, I've just thrown up a quick video from my testing on Azalea, the list that I've kind of been working on. Uh, it's just a short video up on Patreon if you want to see some of the things that, differences that, that I've had in my testing, things that I think are particularly good, slightly different take. 
I do just one last thing on this kind of print run and collation thing. I want to talk about the thing just quickly that because I talk a lot about it in limited time only and its impact on draft. But the thing that I actually think is bigger and is going to impact players for a longer time uh, because, okay, so this legendary thing, I think the fix is if you're going to road to national skirmish, whatever, at least just say Japanese product. Mm -hmm. Because the Japanese print run looks like as expected, right? So then you can avoid this kind of problem of maybe having skewed drafts, whatever it is, field, etc. The problem I'm I'm not seeing as much talked about, and I've been talking about this on Twitter, and I've talked about it in limited time only, is the differences in European, the Belgian print run, mm. and the Japanese print run distribution of commons and rares. The the set the print run is fundamentally different. It has a different distribution of cards in the packs, which I think is a really big issue for preparing for the pro tour if you're using not knowing whether i need to use japanese packs or i have to try and source belgium which in the southern hemisphere i, I don't know where i get that it's only japanese uh, print run down here so that's and i'll explain this just quickly basically in a japanese pack you open the first nine cards you see are going to be a combination of three to four generic commons and then uh, five to six um class commons and you are basically going to see a 2-2-2 two, two, two split or you're going to see a 2-2-1 two, two, split of the class commons. And very rarely, I, I believe it's about one in a box, you will see a pack that has three of a class, but will still minimum have one of a class. And then you're going to get two rares in every pack. There's no change to that. And you get one hybrid, you get your equipment, and you get your rainbow foil. Now in EU packs, the distribution is very different. You can have one to three rares. You can have two hybrid cards. You can have no hybrid card. You can have zero of a class common. <laughs> and uh so it's it's very very different and i that is going to impact on draft uh, quite significantly and I, I i mean i don't need to dive into it too much but i'm sure you understand brendan i think our listeners will kind of understand what that means is that it's really hard to understand first of all what's you know i, I before we get to pro tour i think we need to know what packs are going to be used because how do you know you're trying to understand what's been taken from a pack you're trying to understand signals and then the other piece of it is that what what should i be practicing like one rare versus always two rare packs or three one to three rare packs. That is a difference. And same with these these class packs as well. So I think it hurts players uh, looking to participate in the Pro Tour twofold, right? Um, first and the most obvious is that you don't know what to prepare for, right? Let's say you did have access to infinite product. Um, you wouldn't know to put your time in the Japanese distribution or the Belgian distribution, and that's an issue. And I think it's easily solved by Legendary Studios coming out and saying, like they said with Road to Nationals, they're like, use this product. They say Pro Tour, Japanese product. That's what you got to expect. But they don't fix the they don't fix the secondary or tertiary problem, which is you have to be able to source that product in order to practice. And that is, there's not really a way to solve that, unfortunately. Um, if you are in, a, in an area where it's hard to get the product, uh, you know, the specific product that will be used at the Pro Tour. So I'm not sure how they're going to solve that. And you're right, it's a huge issue for the Pro Tour. Um, what are your thoughts? It's not just an issue for Pro Tour as well, though. It's an issue for Road to Nationals. If you're going to a draft Road to Nationals, how do you know what products you're going to use? How do you know what to be practicing with? Yeah, it's I look at it more like, you know, Road to Nationals, if the competitive integrity of Road to Nationals is affected by this problem, um, not ideal. If it's the Pro Tour, devastating. Absolutely unacceptable. Can't happen, right? Like, it's they can't have their premier com competitive event of sort of this part of the year or the quarter be something like, yeah, I mean, you have no idea what sort of pack distribution you're going into and you're opening zero class cards. It's ridiculous, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm curious to hear in the comments, do people think I'm, I'm overblowing this a little bit? Like, I, this is something that is pretty near and dear to me. I've spent since release, since pre-release actually, trying to collate information on the pack differences because it came apparent very quickly and it wasn't, it's not to do with this legendary print run issue. It's actually just a, this is like, and Chris Gearing actually replied, so Chris Gearing, who is a lead developer at Legend Story Shoes, actually replied to one of my t tweets saying uh, he's going to look to put out an article to explain the limitations of the printers at each of the Belgian and Japanese factories to explain the differences in print runs, mm -hmm. e effectively, is what this tweet says. Um, and I think it's really needed. My kind of reply was, I think you need to be clear about what is going to be used at the Pro Tour, because I think it's, um, yeah, uh, to me, it is a really big issue. It's a, it's a pretty big discrepancy so i'd love to see lss come out and and explain what's happened here and also what to expect for op events and what product is going to be used because to me to me that the, the pack distribution that is quite a big difference mm -hmm. yeah understanding pack distribution distribution is absolutely core to drafting at the highest level so 
Uh, hopefully, we do get some sort of uh, some sort of clarification soon. On to the command and cookout. This one is from MMB. That's the nickname I've given him. <laughs> Your boy, <laughs> my boy MMB. I think the last time we we <laughs> we gave Nick, Nick that nickname. Uh, they say, do you think LSS needs to rework Spectra for the release of Dust Till Dawn, or do you think it fills a need in modern day fab? Um, so two questions. Does it fill a need in modern day fab? I don't think so. Do will they rework it? I doubt it. Um, I think uh, Spectra is a u- ubiquitously hated <laughs> hated uh, uh, keyword, but <sighs> there are some people that love it. You know, and that's I think that there's a lot of things in card games, and maybe it's uh, it's true that those kind of divisive sort of I don't know zero sum fun kind of designs don't shouldn't be in card games but they are and i think a, a lot of people even you know including myself sometimes like them if they're on the right side of the board so i don't think they'll rework it i would be surprised maybe it is too fun maybe it is fundamentally too powerful to exist in the game and it will warp the format in a degenerate way if it exists at all um but right now i don't think that they would rework it um but i'm not sure that it actually fills a need in modern day fab, like a quote unquote need. I don't think that, I don't think the Spectra is a need at all. You know, I, what, what is the, yeah, what's the, what's the need? Is the need to curb decks that can go wide and deal with threats? You know, to, you know, is it a kind of a, an idea of, well, you have to choose? Is that the kind of need? I mean, I'm not really sure I understand what the, the need of Spectra is. I think it's, it's a mechanic that people have a lot of issues with. It's a mechanic that for me personally, I have less issue with, but I've also, I tell you what, I'd love to hear if you've got any more thoughts, Brendan. But I've also had some spitball ideas on on how they could uh, look at white illusionist for the next set. Well, I'm trying to before we dive into that. I want to what what about Spectra is is good, and what about is important? I think that it's Spectra represents some sort of like progressive board persistence that and snowball effect that doesn't exist in Flesh and Blood just kind of across the board, right? This sort of like Magic the Gathering-esque, like I've developed this board state that you progressively can't deal with, you know, more and more. It just stacks up and snowballs and you, you're you able to put yourself in the position as the person playing the Spectra cards of, you know, gaining control over the game and assembling this like Exodia, right? And I don't think you can get that effect from a lot of like almost anything else in in the game, right? Like I guess kind of Dash, get called, Dash. Dash Control, yeah, it gets a little bit close, but Spectra Spectra is unique, and I think it does provide a unique player experience for trying to fill that archetype of control in this game. Yeah, I, I do. I think it forces you to make decisions, and I think that's a really interesting part of Flesh and Blood is making decisions. The problem becomes when you can no longer really have impact with your decisions. You know, when it's like, okay, I have to attack this, and I'm still behind, and I have no way to really get back ahead. So I have a couple of I guess things that I think could happen with Dust or Dawn that allow this. So I think you can either allow Spectra to live as is. You print a Light Illusionist, Prism, whatever it is, uh, Prism as a Light Illusionist. You could also, I don't know, maybe they could print Prism as not a Light Illusionist, for instance, just an Illusionist. But if you want to have people allowed to play with their Light Illusionist cards, and then I think one of the things you can do is you can either leave Spectra as is, and you can offer tools to deal with Spectra. You know, I'm thinking Bam Brace, Crown of Seeds, kind of, uh, <laughs> which I don't think is the perfect solution. The other thing that I think can be done, and I, I don't know how well this would work, but you can actually print your Light Illusionist Hero, whether that be a new prism, whatever it is, and you just say, you, you can't play Spectra cards in your deck on the hero. <laughs> or you, you, give, so you make the hero balanced enough that playing Spectra offsets a, a pretty poor hero stats, potentially. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so not being able to play Spectra Print on the Hero seems... Um, it would seem Thank extreme, you. and I think that adding any sort of condition, like you can only have two Spectres on the board at any given mm-hmm. time, is also too clunky. So, uh, although I think that would maybe be a more eloquent way of it, you know, if in, in a perfect world you could, the max amount of Spectres you could have was two, right? So people could get, get past it with their, their action point plus some sort of tech card, be it time skippers, et cetera. So there's always that ability to swing the board back. Um, I don't think that it would sort of be executed in a, in an eloquent way. It would probably feel very, very, uh, very inorganic. Mm, it's tough. Yeah. I guess it's going to be really interesting to see how Alice has decided to use Spectra. I mean, quite clearly the community has a pretty, I would say the the aggregate, the overall is a, is a more negative than positive, right? So I think Alice will take that on board and just 
look at how they use or don't use Spectrum moving forward. I, I would I would doubt that we will see cards printed with Spectra on them. That's for sure. But mm. um, how they kind of balance what's already around that that's the next thing. Like you know, I can't see them banning cards. You know, printing and then I'll be like, okay, we'll print this, but ban ArcLight, for instance. I, I don't know. It would be surprising. They have um, they. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like they have every opportunity in the world right now to just print a light illusion hero that is balanced in the context of those cards already existing, right? They shouldn't mm-hmm. be printing a light illusionist hero, have it come into existence and then be like, oh, we're surprised that these cards are broken in this hero, right? Like they know they exist. So just balance the hero around it if possible. Um, anyway, thanks for the question. If you want to get your question read out in next week's command and cookout section, shoot us a comment on YouTube, YouTube specifically, um, and we'll get it queued up. And let's go on to the main topic, Hayden, which is the landscape of class constructed in Outsiders, Azalea v. Azalea Finals. Why don't you just, uh, why don't you break down the entire top eight for me? Because I know this is, this is one of those top eights that happens and all the developers get on, get on Twitter and are like, look at our baby, right? Like, <laughs> just like, I feel like they're so proud of it. Um, but it's like, I don't know if it's indicative of an actual healthy format. Again, I'm not, not even in relation to this argument of like, does, does color pie or does, you know, deck diversity actually mean a good format, but also it's like one of the first constructed events and people are just bringing crazy stuff. Anyway, Hayden, what, tell me about this top eight. Oh, it, it's so funny. There's another term for what the developers might be doing, um, but, you know, we'll keep that off the airways. <laughs> uh, no, so, I mean, the event that we're talking about is this brawl event. Who hosted it? Sorry, Brendan. So uh, I know Realm Games was Realm a part Games. of it, but I, I'm not. Sh- I th- there might have been another store that was doing it with them, so it's not coming to mind like immediately. But definitely, Realm Games is like involved. So it was, yeah, in Chicago. Uh, I don't know the total number of players. I believe it was about eighty or so players playing the event. It was class constructed, the first class constructed event we've had, and and a reasonable size event. I mean, we had a lot of well known North American players travel to this event and play in this event. So I mean, top eight included Michael Hamilton. Uh, Brody Spurlock, uh, glasses in this top eight. Uh, Sam Dando, um, a few names that people would, uh, Joe Robles, some names that people would, would see quite frequently on sort of US events. So, you know, no slouches in this top eight. And the, the top eight breakdown looked like two Azalea, one Icelander, one Azuri, Switchblade, one Dash, one Lexi, one Ultim, one Briar. So, as Brennan says, a pretty diverse looking top eight for this first event. And there was also, I believe, an event on the west coast of um, the US at the same time. I'm not sure player numbers, I think, in the end was... I actually can't remember. I didn't I didn't catch any coverage of that. I believe that was uh, called the AGE event, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did see some coverage of this event, of the of the brawl. Uh, it wasn't a battle hardened or anything, but I believe there was like some cash prizes and stuff. So there was incentive for people to travel, incentive for people to bring good decks. In the end, number one played and represented deck was... Or am I? Mm-hmm. Uh, now, nah, hey, that one came out stop, of nowhere. Stop, stop me if you've heard this one. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Number one uh, most played hero was an illusionist, and uh, it did not make any into top eight. Have you heard that before? <laughs> I feel like I've been hearing that for years. Um, wow, we're gonna have some people rioting off of that one. The illusionist, the illusionist crowd is so sensitive to their terrible conversions over the years. But is that yeah? That's that's true. But Azalea was the second most played deck, and. I think not surprising. Like there was a lot of hype around Azalea. Anyone who had kind of put together, you didn't even have to, not rocket science, put some pumps in your deck, put some good arrows in your deck, put Death Dealer in there, play some games. And uh, like, I think, you know, both Levi and uh, who made the final and Brody's deck, very solid lists. I don't Mm. think they're perfect. I think there's some cards that I was surprised were being played, cards that weren't being played. I think that people have a lot of opportunity to refine these Azalea lists, but you can already see the power of what Azalea can be in this format. And then outside of that, you know, I think, both just good players and and good solid decks in the top eight. And you look at something like Sam Dando making the semifinals with Azuri. Very cool to see that already. Um, so it looks like there's a lot to be figured out in this kind of yeah. meta is basically what this event tells me. What's really funny too is Michael Hamilton and Brody Spurlock make top eight of this event. They both play in the same testing group and, and Brody brings this alien. Michael brings all reliable in the form of Icelander. I wonder what the rhetoric um, is in that testing group at the moment. If Azalea is a front-running deck, or these are just two pet decks by independent players, because so early in a format, um, you know, even in a testing group, players can be working somewhat independently and just bring whatever they like. Uh, so, yeah, I wonder if Michael Hamilton is also on the uh, the sort of Azalea boat that Brody's Brody's currently spearheading. 
I know Michael is a fan of Ranger. Yeah. Lexi is, he is a deck he's played before. It's one he was like considering for PT1. Um, I mean, in fairness, though, there is about 800 people in that testing team. So I just wonder <laughs> if maybe there, there was some disconnect in there. <laughs> true. True. Uh, love you guys. Love you guys. Uh, I do think, you know, Brody is someone who I think has traditionally been known for his Briar play, but has really stepped out to try new things, try new decks, sort of push the envelope. And clearly, I mean, at this point, Battle Hard and King, but also just very clearly a very good player. Beat Michael Hamilton in the Swiss, beat Michael Hamilton in the semifinals in two very good games. I didn't I managed to check out bits and pieces of them. I mean, where does the meta go from here? Like, I think people are going to now look to say, what is Azalea's weakness? You know, is Azalea the kind of, quote unquote, the weak one deck, the deck that is the deck to beat as we head towards? Because we, we now have, we have uh, Battle Hardens coming up. We have a couple of events between now and pt and this is the time for people to to work out where the meta really lies because outside of azalea being maybe the the deck with the target on its back what else is this meta right now like bromai that was the most played deck but is that actually what people are thinking about i really got to hear the lore on why dromai was the most played deck in that event um traditionally a good good into ranges i think is is the reason i would say i would just i mean okay Yes, sure, right? But I'd be, surprised, I'd be surprised if the first tournament people go, I'm bringing the deck to counter Azalea, and everybody just sleeves up Dromai, because Dromai is also like, I feel like Dromai is one of those decks that, I don't know, it doesn't tend to be in everybody's toolbox, you know? I feel like it's uh, it's kind of a bit more No, niche. it is surprising. Yeah, it but is a it's bit more, more niche. But if Icelander, in my opinion, was the, the best deck hitting out of this Dynasty meta, mm-hmm. Ultim probably second most. Yeah. And then you have this new player in Ranger and the aggro decks look like, you know, no one's playing Briar, for instance. People, you know, Fire's completely dropped off. Yeah, maybe Kautu's going to show up because it's new and it's got these really cool tools. But Dromai's stock really, I think, did rise heading into this weekend. Like, I think people made smart decisions to play Dromai. It seemed on paper like a really good choice. Maybe the reason we don't see people making the top eight with Dromai is because, like you say, it is one of those ones that requires a and notching you about as a piece of the toolbox and maybe but these players just didn't quite have it for instance or the pairings didn't go their way like there, there's a lot of it's one event it's really hard to say that you know, that was a bad call to play drama i think mm-hmm. actually on paper really good call to play drama mm-hmm. yeah so let's talk about where the meta came from because i think that's important in context so obviously icelander but also old him i mean old him really kind of being I don't know, the the big bad wolf of the last format. You had these fatigue old hymns, you had these sort of tempo old hymns playing, you know, the big two for eights, X for tens. Like that, I don't know how much showed up, but at least it didn't it didn't convert. And that, I mean that's what's particularly interesting to me. Cause I think if you look at if you look at a previous build of Azalea, um you'd be pretty happy with your old him deck, not considering the new cards. So all of these old him players, or, you know, at least a lot of them should have been like, would have looked at outsiders and have deduced that Azalea can now beat old him. Cause I think that that was a pretty poor matchup for Azalea in the past. And this is like, the, this is some of the stuff I've heard from people that I've been talking to is that Azalea with the new tools um, is no longer subject to, to, to like a sort of defensive old him deck, which definitely was the thing in the past. Mm, it might not be an unwinnable matchup, but I still think it's a pretty bad matchup. That's been my experience so far. As yes, as the tools, I still think Ultim well positioned. Mm-hmm. To be honest, I do you want to talk about meta breakdown? Uh, I was trying to find it because I had seen it aired, so I'm desperately searching to try and find uh, where I'd seen the meta breakdown for the event. Um, so maybe we can come back to that in in a second. Okay. I'll find it. Well, I'll hit you with a fastball here, and I'll say that uh, Codex of Frailty should be banned, Aiden. What do you think? Oh, <laughs> but this is this is the the rhetoric going around on on Twitter, right? So um, this apparently this also just quickly the brawl was apparently min max and Realm okay, Games. That's what I just want to make sure I, I clarify because uh, both really awesome community stores and, and do a lot for Flesh and Blood in North America. Uh, sh- sorry, you asked a question. Uh, some some random question. <laughs> <laughs> I think you remember my question. Codex of LT. Yeah. No. No. I mean, so the kind of uh, the card's really good, right? And the card is somewhat can be above rate for sure. Can be very, very impactful in the game, right? The that frailty is worth two to three. The ponder replaces itself, so let's say it's worth three, and you get an attack action, an arrow back. You know, it can it can genuinely be around like a, a one card ten, right? That and that's what people are pointing to. It has restrictions. It it does defend for two. It's not always going to be that. That's for sure. Um, but I think we. 
need some of these cards in the game these cards that have some restrictions that potentially allow your opponent to have somewhat of a mirror effect you know they can get uh they can turn a card from their hand into a, a much better card in their arsenal they don't have to play it next turn either and be uh, susceptible to the frailty they can hold it for a turn for instance right maybe against ninja you uh, sorry against ranger you get back the cnc but you don't play it the following turn you hold it for another turn so I do think, you know, you, you've got to weigh up both sides. The card is very, very good, but I, I, I don't think it should be banned. Could it be banned in the future? I mean, maybe. It's a really powerful card, but um, with how much further can you take it more? Than, you know, like, if I look at some of those powerful cards in the game and the cards that are candidates to get banned, they're cards that have high ceilings and the ceiling can really be pushed. How much higher can the Codex of Frailty be pushed? And when I think about it, I sort of sit down and break it down, that kind of potential one card for eight to ten value is really where that ceiling is it's really hard to go above and beyond that but what it does give you is consistency and consistency is really good yeah honestly uh, i couldn't i i don't know i don't know if it should be banned um i i don't even i haven't had enough experience with it to to see this power level that people are talking about but i do know that people like to hop on hop on the bandwagon pretty quickly when it comes to new powerful cards that come out of sets and talking about bands happens every single time i would say give it Give it a little bit more time, not for the card to show its to show its power or lack of power, but to let people adapt to the deck that's abusing it. Right? If if it is that good, but it doesn't really it, the deck that it slots into isn't isn't a tier one deck or is countered easily, like you know Azalea um, potentially is, then you'll see quickly that people will stop talking about this card. I mean, like you said, Hayden, I think that that deck kind of needs cards like this, um, but mm-hmm. yeah, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I would just say that probably it's a bit early for, <laughs> for the discussion. I mean, we'll, we'll see. But I think people on both sides have, have good points um, in terms of, you know, a look at the power and the consistency of this card and then also a, you know, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Hayden, you threw, up, uh, you threw up a little deck tech on Patreon for your Azalea deck. Talk to me a little mm-hmm. bit about what you did when building your deck and how it, di- it differentiated from some of the list that we saw top the Realm Games mid-max event. Yeah, so I might even go one step earlier, right? And you talked about where did the meta come from? You know, this idea mm-hmm. of Icelander and Ultim being kings of the previous format, Briar really maybe not performing, Lixie being an out- outlier, these sorts of things, right? And kind of the first thing was, okay, where where do we see this format going? That's the kind of first thing we always do when we sit down to look at a new format. And, you know, we're the, the end goal heading towards the culmination of this Outsiders uh, season in Pro Tour Baltimore, I guess. So where do we think the meta is going to go? Well, I think the first place was like, okay, how good is Ranger? And that's that's where we wanted to start. How, how good is Ranger? So, um, and then what do we expect to combat? And one that was like popping up was, I think we'll see some amount of Assassin. We will see Ultim continue because of the strength of it. We will see Icelander and we mm-hmm. will see, um, we'll see Katsu. I think Katsu is good, has a lot of good tools that it's gotten from, from this new set. So that's kind of where in my mind it started and then from there it was like what arrows do i want what arrows do we want access to and so if i talk about some of maybe the differences between the azalea sort of shell that i've been working on playing with um between myself and and dan mostly i would say that some of the differences is i, I think leave i played one endless already played zero endless arrow and i can kind of understand that it's not a traditional go wide like it is with lexi but i think that card is super super powerful and i think you want to have access to minimum one endless i think probably two to three is probably correct um a card that i'm really high on is a card like heat seeker from dynasty that is this you know on hit effective draw card and i think that's so powerful in azalea because you can always azalea away the card afterwards um so it always can turn into something else I think that that's a card that I think was a surprise to see people not playing. And then I think what kind of they both went for is this idea of, of playing cards like Rebel and E-Strike for consistency. Rebel also allows you to see the top card to potentially then Azalea with a bit more confidence. I think probably where I was at was I've been trying to utilize Skullbone Crosswrap a bit more. So mm-hmm. a card that I think has been like an MVP for me is like take aim. You know, zero for three pump that has reload that allows you to put an arrow and, and flip it to Skullbone Crosstrap and gain the, the information that way, as opposed to maybe something like like Rebel. Um, and I also think that Take Aim, the real power of Take Aim is that it allows you to play things like, you know, two card hands uh, off with a zero cost arrow, something like an endless arrow, for instance, or a bolt and shot uh, for two, for, you know, basically a two card seven, which I think is, is where you want to be on some of these intermediary turns. So I was surprised to not to see them not play Take Aim because it's a card that's really overperformed for me. Um, read the glide path. I think, I think is outstanding. And if you're not playing that in your Azalea deck, I think you know you're missing a missing a trick there. 
Uh, and then I guess probably the the other piece is you know they're playing both both of them, or particularly Brody was playing a little bit less of some of the on hit effects. So um, you know I was just going to grab Brody's deck. He had the infecting shot, of course. Then he had uh, the lace with blood rot. So those two, and then he had lace with inertia, mm-hmm. which I think is really really good, particularly really important against Icelander. And then beyond that, doesn't have any of these these on hit effects pumps or arrows from the new set whereas i think for myself uh when we were sort of looking at it go back to my list quickly sorry sedation sedation shot i think for more inertia if you expect icelander is is particularly relevant um and i think even if you expect a lot of aggro lace with like wide lace the frailty can be can be really important against kadachis and extra arsenal so I w- I've, I'm not on Lace's Frailty. I think it's hard to find space for it, but that is also a consideration. Mm-hmm. And then I guess last thing I'll kind of point out between some of the, the lists I've seen was Brody opted to play Widowmaker, which I'm not too sure. I didn't see him play it. I'm not sure what Widowmaker is for. I maybe potentially for some longer games where equipment runs out. It, not an arrow that I thought was particularly good because, of course, if you defend with equipment, then it, it does it does stop the ability. He also played Rain Raises. So did Levi. Um I wasn't particularly impressed with Rain Raisers, I think, in testing. I know they both played nine Bolton shots. They were trying to leverage the Bolton shot and Rain Raisers, I'm guessing, but not something that I was particularly a fan of, I think. So those are the, the main differences. I think, that, look, I, I think there's so much development that will happen with Azalea in the next few weeks. You know, you now need to start thinking about the mirror match. What does that look like? Do you start to put defense reactions? What kind of defense reactions do your arrows change? What arrows you want to look at? You know, is something like remorseless make way for something else there's there's so many i guess options that you can go for yeah i'm just i'm particularly looking at the rain razors i'm assuming like the like your your sort of median use case is zero for four on rain razor so a zero for four yellow that doesn't block and then you're also playing it on your snapdragon's turns potentially perch grapplers so like maybe you're getting a zero for six out of it i'm just I'm wondering about this card in particular because it doesn't block. I guess if the meta is not dominated by Briar and Katsu and stuff, you're much less likely to get punished for it as well. Um, It's the card that really, to be honest, I'm excited for you to ask this to Brody when you record, but it's the card that made the least amount of sense to me, I think, in these decks. It was the card that was kind of... I played it one or two games that I didn't didn't perform. You know, it was very hard to even get the zero for four Mm -hmm. because you're not often going wide. You have to bolt and shot. And then if you're playing yellow bolt and shots, you're lining up to a zero for three in your Bolton shot. I, I think Azalea is best going tall and you have the consistency now. You have the tools to do it. You have these really good pumps. I mean, that's why I talk about take aim. It's such a consistent way to get an arrow in, or not even an arrow, right? The good thing with take aim, the, the, the thing that kills Azalea is you draw three, sorry, four pumps. Yeah. And you, what do you do? Take aim allows you to reload, flip, elbow and cross wrap ops and Azalea that way. So th- that's another a strong point, I think, uh, to take aim. Mm-hmm. All right, and well, so don't take this from a macro, right? Because we already kind of did that. But if you could speculate on sort of the, where do you think the meta is going to go? Like specific decks, how do you think it will adapt? Um, you know, you might be going out on a limb here, but what do you think is going to happen off the back of these results and cause constructed? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you what I'm, what I would do and what I'm going to do. I think the first thing is, okay, what is, what is good into Azalea? Ultim immediately springs to mind. What does Ultim look like in this format? The, the deck hasn't lost anything. It's still, Ultim still has a lot of powerful tools. So is it just default good into Azalea? Do you have to play particular builds? I think is where people will go to next. What does the rest of the format look like? You know, a really diverse top eight. I think you could see a battle harden next week. I know uh, Pittsburgh, I think it's coming up. That could look really quite diverse. Uh, it is, I, I want to say that CC. I didn't actually check this. <laughs> probably should have. It seems like something I should probably do. Um, but for the next, you know, the next CC event that we're going to see and, and have coverage of and people are going to travel to, I think that is the consideration. Um, aggro decks that can have good defensive options are interesting as well. So Katsu comes to mind, you know, I think you can prep your Katsu to be ready for Azalea, for instance. Um, and then I think just mirror opportunities. Like Azalea is really powerful. It has a lot of consistency now, so it's not going to go anywhere. It's not like people are just all of a sudden going to show up with the, the silver bullet next week and it's going to be it again. Like it's going to be here to stay, I think. So uh, people are going to develop in it. They're going to iterate on the current Azalea lists and then people are going to look 
for ways to combat it. And people are going to look for, that's going to evolve into, okay, what is the other decks that people care about? I think that's the next step we need to find out. Is it going to be Ultimate Icelander again? Or is it potentially going to be different decks? Is it going to be something like Katsu and Dash, for instance? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting as we as we draw closer into Baltimore, uh, particularly for this for this class constructed meta to see where we will land. Um, you know, obviously, on my end, fingers crossed that uh, Icelander does inch out of the meta, so I can say, "Told you so." Um, <laughs> but still, not looking. I think bright. it's happening. Yeah, still not looking bright. Well, let's um, let's zoom out. How do you feel about this meta, both limited from a, dra- a draft, of course, and constructed? In the context of playing a high-level professional event, do you feel like it's a good meta? Do you feel like you have a lot of agency as a player? Do you think that your input will result in output? You know, your work will will it convert? Is it is it the kind of meta that you would be happy to play as a professional player at the the Pro Tour this year? Yeah, um, just quickly, want to clarify: it's definitely not Pittsburgh. I can't remember what's coming up next, so uh, I. I'm not sure. I think I think I think Pro Tour Baltimore is. I think so. Because I'm pretty sure Pittsburgh is after that. Because I'm going. <laughs> it is. It's in May. Yeah. It's like Richmond is. Rich. Sorry. Richmond is the next, which is the 15th to 16th, and then we have skirmish season, of course. So Richmond is basically, I think, where we're going to get the the lay of the land heading into, um, basically heading into the event. So we've only got one big event, really. So it's. I think it's a lot of the iteration and how the format is going to evolve is going to come from internal testing teams. It's going to come from content people are putting out there and things that people are putting out into the open uh so yeah it's gonna be interesting do i think there's a lot of yes you have a lot of decisions to make in in both formats i think draft is really really interesting i think it's a great format for competitive level play i think it's going to be a really interesting format to see how the i think different teams different groups of people are going to come up with different ideas on how you should draft this format they're going to come up on the card power level is quite similar in a lot of cases you know there's a lot of smaller gaps between what you can and, and what you can be doing so i think people are going to come up with different strategies people are going to try and break the format of course they're going to try and come up with you know some sort of crazy force this all yellow benji deck that people won't draft for instance some people are going to come up with you know just good fundamentals of taking good cards people are going to figure out how to you know have a really powerful riptide deck people are going to figure stuff out and there's mm-hmm. a lot to figure out in the draft format and i think construct is the same it, it looks like we're moving a, you know, i don't want to speak too soon but towards maybe something that resembles more mid-range than we've seen previously and <laughs> i know i know, I know. what you wish for really icelander crazy. is the pinnacle of mid-range and <laughs> everybody likes mid-range know, until I, icelander's at the, the top i know but like disruptive elements you have an aggro deck in azalea that now mm. disrupts you have this mid-range deck in icelander with a semi-combo finish that disrupts you have ultim that can go both ways all of a sudden it's like do just pure hyper aggro or pure hyper control or pure combo are they good enough to combat mm. what the tools that these decks have? So, you know, I think that's why we're going to see Briar continue to struggle. We're going to see uh, Ultim have to find its place. I think, you know, Dromai is going to have to find its place. So it's, it's a really, there's a lot of, the games are going to be interesting, at least, I think. If the I, decks are going to be interesting. Yeah. If I was looking at Baltimore right now, um, well, I wouldn't be looking at Baltimore. I'd be looking at Richmond because it's really, really important uh, in terms of context for Baltimore. Because if we took, if we extrapolated the current results, um, you know, it might be a great meta, but it'd be a terrible meta to prepare for. <laughs> it's a lot you got to prepare for here. Um, if you're if you're if you're looking at the back up, looking off the back of the results from this past weekend. Um, but yeah, at least at least there's Richmond coming up, and I guess there will be some. So, you know, Brody's going to do a deck tech with us. I'm sure there'll be plenty of other deck techs floating around on content creators channels and with the sort of um, with the teams that exist on Twitter. So that mm-hmm. does give a lot of context for Classic Constructed, but yeah, right now we're looking at a pretty unclear format. I do expect one or two decks to inch out ahead. That just tends to be what always happens. Um, but right now it's a it's a diverse Classic Constructed, but a tough one to prepare for for a Pro Tour. We we haven't had this before. Pro Tour one, we had a Pro Quest season before that that had the same sets. You know, had Everfest. Mm-hmm. Number two, we had a I want to say Road to National season with with our uprising before we got to pro tour allele the format didn't change before we got to worlds it was the exact same format this is the first time that we have a set come out we have one or two battle hardens and you know actually just one battle hardened and you know sort of um grassroots level events and that's and and content and a few other things to really show us what a format could look like there's going to be this format if i had to say right now is going to be the most diverse format we've seen for a pro tour yet for of the three we had last year so the fourth fourth you know pro event and that's super exciting um yeah i mean 
it's for personally, I mean, the decks I'm looking at right now are definitely still still got Nyan Azalea. Um, you know, something that I started with. Katsu is particularly interesting to me. Uh, you know, maybe this is it. Maybe look, Brendan. Look, I wouldn't want to say it too soon, but maybe maybe Kano becomes viable know, in this format. Gonna, I don't know. <laughs> Kano is obviously a big meme, but the thing is, it's like as the me- Kano is good on two ends, right? The meta gets. Uh, very linear, very sort of, you know, you have your, you have your top three decks. Kano can be, Kano can be good there because it's very targetable. You go the opposite side of the spectrum. You, nobody knows what to prepare for. Sideboard slots are tight. Kano is also good there because you know what gets cut mm-hmm. first. So it's often Arcane Barrier. It's often Spell Void. Things that are really silver bullet for Kano, things like Oasis or Spy. People are going to cut <laughs> that stuff. <laughs> you right? say it. Well, I mean, they are. Like, uh, if they can, yeah, right? Course. If it doesn't make sense in other matchups, that's what they're going to cut. So Kano's good on both extremes. Where Kano's not good is where, yeah, I mean, there's a predictable meta in the top one to two decks just dunk on Kano. But other situations, he, he sort of thrives in the extremes of like the predictable and the unpredictable. So... It's it's a potential deck, and I, honestly, in a if a meta like this, if we were to fast forward to Baltimore, you know, and it was coming up next weekend, I think there would be more people bringing Kano to that tournament than just me, you, and Sasha. Like, I think the people know the deck exists. People are happy to bring it, you know, especially off the back of this recent Blitz success. Like, other people are picking up this deck, and I think the power level is very clear, you know, and it's it's niche use case at that. It happens for us that the niche use case has been pretty much every tournament, but it is niche at that. And if you can find the right tournament to line up, I think it's a great deck. I mean, of the people I've worked with, you know, for Leal and then Worlds as well, at those two events, I think there was three other people playing Kano that weren't weren't the people we prepared with. So um, one thing I will say, I I think Dromai is of particular interest. It's probably the deck that I'm going to dive into next, I think, because it can potentially be rewarded for a meta that really moves to a mid-range and spreads wide, um, especially if the aggro decks are kind of struggling to find a foothold. Mm. I think that is a deck that is of particular interest, yeah. or a, a, a hero that's particular interest, and it might look different to how it has in the past. Yeah, there's a really nice triangle there, right? Like Azalea is the top deck. Azalea, Azalea is good against aggro decks. It has been, even before Outsiders. Mm-hmm. Keep, so was. Azalea keeping the aggro decks in check becomes the top deck. Jeremiah is a good answer to that, right? Um, I haven't seen the current I haven't seen the current Azalea v. Jeremiah matchup. I don't know if Azalea just you know goes over the top of that deck now, but if you're looking at sort of a, you know, the zoomed out perspective of a triangle that you could exploit with a deck like Jeremiah, I think that those are perfect conditions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Completely agree. Very excited to see. Well, yeah, I mean, it's going to evolve. I'm going to continue to test and sort of give my my views on what I'm finding in testing, um, kind of what's what's interesting. But yeah, this this meta is shaping up to be one of the most diverse and interesting we've had so far in this game. So awesome Great. well thanks to the devs until something goes wrong they will be coming for you you get your time now <laughs> well until codex of Anush gets banned yeah. uh, right. sorry uh, frailty well that's it for this week if you're listening to this on a podcast platform there is a video version of this on youtube at youtube.com slash arsenal pass hayden and i are on twitter at brendan apg at fian underscore dale and of course patreon hayden did put up his azalea deck tech on patreon and we got a brody deck tech coming on the main channel and a cyborg guide tips and tricks all that stuff coming to patreon like usual so check that out out. it does have out a ton hayden anything else before we close it out nope check out limited time only as well <laughs> all right thanks everyone see you next week